Well, hello everyone. For those of you that are on the call, uh, we, uh, we thank you for attending and uh, we thank you for your valuable time today. Uh, my name is Danielle Bragg. I'm the uh, Vice President and Co-Founder of the Headhunters. And uh, for those of you that have been on some of our webinars in the past, um, you'll know that this is really a series that we've been running, a uh, free series for our clients that we've been running this year um, in order to keep our headhunter clients up to date on current market trends. We also think it's a nice way to add value to your business and allows you to ask the questions that sometimes cross our mind when we're at our desks and we really don't know where to go to have some of our questions answered. So before I introduce you to today's guest speaker, I'd like to just cover a few housekeeping items. There is going to be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions, please feel free uh, to uh, type them into the chat panel as we go. Um, we will only be addressing questions at the end and we'll try and cover as many as possible, but we do want to be respectful of everyone's time today. Um, if you um, are interested, an email will be sent out tomorrow. It'll go to all attendees with a link to the recording and a copy of the slides. It'll also uh, include the audio um, and so that you guys can review any information again. Our theme today is actually a really exciting one for us. It's on diversity and inclusion. And what we're seeing in the marketplace today is this seems to be a really hot topic right now, especially with HR. Um, so we're hoping that today we'll provide you with a bit of an introduction um, of, for those of you seeking to understand how to build and implement diversity and inclusion strategy within your organization. So I'd like to welcome and introduce our guest speaker. Her name is Nicole McCabe from SAP. And Nicole is actually joining us today from Philadelphia. And Nicole's background is she was actually uh, with SAP as the global head of gender equality for four and a half years. She was hired to define and execute a sustainable strategy to help SAP achieve its gender diversity target by the end of 2017. And she managed to attain that within six months ahead of schedule. She's also uh, led the largest EDGE certification pro project, making SAP the first multinational technology company to achieve this global business certification standard for gender equality. Today, she's a senior director of business development within SAP's corporate strategy team. Welcome, Nicole, and over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, lovely introduction and thanks for having me here today. Um, as mentioned, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion, why it matters, and then also start to touch on the topic of unconscious bias. That's a buzzword that we hear a lot out there now in the media. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't, um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then obviously I'd love to leave individuals with quick ways to get started because this can also be an extremely overwhelming topic. And I think we have a quick poll that we would like to launch first, just around, you know, does your organization currently have a DNI or diversity and inclusion um, strategy? So I'll give everyone a couple minutes to, to answer that. And while I give them 30 seconds or so more, uh, I will tell you that, you know, you mentioned the targets that SAP had when it came to women specifically, and I'll, we, just, we focus on different elements of diversity and inclusion. Um, but for the women specifically, you know, we had started at a little over 18% women in leadership, and that was five years ago, and now we're at 25% and growing. So, um, but a lot had to go into that, and I'll, I'll tell you all of the tales that I've learned along the way. So it looks like most of you do not have a um, DNI strategy, and I, I'll use DNI throughout the presentation to mean diversity and inclusion. Some of you don't know, and then uh, some of you do, which is fantastic. Okay, we can clear that. Thank you. So at SAP, it really diversity and inclusion really became paramount. I would say back in 2010, 2011, um, and we're a 40 year plus organization. So it started to become really important because we noticed the diversity of our customers, of the nationalities of employees that were working together. We were increasingly global in our, in our dynamics and organizations. So we were constantly dealing across various cultures when we were trying to get work done. 
Um, and then we also started to look at our, our things like women in the workforce, for example. We have a big program around autism at work where we're hiring individuals with autism. Um, so they started to notice that if we take all of these elements together, there's a lot of perspectives and a lot of unique experiences that we can start to draw on that will make us as an organization more successful. So this is where really we started to say, wait a minute, let's tap into some of this, knowing that as a whole, as an organization, it would make us more sustainable and more competitive um, and far more innovative being in the technology space. So why do people even need to care about it? I mentioned the ones that SAP does. But the reality is that the way in which we work is changing. The whole world of work is really changing, right? There's a global population. They're increasingly diverse. Uh, you'll, I'll show some numbers shortly, but right now there's actually five generations working together in the workplace. That's unheard of. That's never happened before, right? You're dealing with um, topics around gender, women coming back into the workforce. Um, how do you promote women? There's a lot of media on the fact that there's great disparities between um, the number of women in the workplace versus those at the top. We're also having a lot of ethnicity as people are traveling all over. They're, they're migrating um, to many different countries. So this is a big topic as well. And then identity, right? So the LGBT topic, we're hearing quite a bit about. Um, and, and so inherently, the population of the world is just becoming increasingly more diverse. Companies, on the other hand, are also experiencing massive skill shortage, right? It's the reason why we see companies start to embrace things like returnship, where they try to get women back into the workforce that have opted yeah. out years before to go and raise families, and now they want to get back in. But companies are really trying to tap into those skills that don't go away with time, right? And then the last thing is, we are in a social. We are so connected nowadays. It's crazy. I know everyone probably has at least three devices that you're on at any given time. Um, so we're incredibly social organizations. And that can impact business. I'll share a quick story on this just to make it relevant to you and real. Um, you know, in a lot of the work that we did around gender here at SAP, we spent a lot of time with the recruitment organization. Um, well, one day on Twitter, we started getting these feeds. You know, SAP is talking about getting women in leadership. This doesn't match, right? And they called us out on the fact that in Saudi Arabia, our, rec our recruiting organization had posted a job posting, and in that it said me men preferred, male candidates preferred, right? Um, well, from a culture standpoint, this is completely acceptable in the Saudi Arabia culture. That was the standard when you do job postings. But because it was in the social space, it went beyond those walls, right? So now that language did not translate from globally what's acceptable. So, you know, we had to have conversations there and you tweak things as you go on your journeys. But I, what it did point out to us is things that used to happen within a country, rather, are now transparent all over the world. A lot of times people will say, why do we even care about a DNI strategy? Um, when I came in four and a half years ago, or five years ago now, uh, it was still seen a little bit as a nice to have strategy, right? Um, but the reality is it actually makes tremendous business sense. And you can see some of the numbers here, so I won't go over all of them. Um, but you can see that if an organization is inclusive, so I think that's another piece of it, right? Not just getting the diverse mix of individuals, but also making the organization inclusive, the amount of cash flow they have per employee is 2.3 times. That's unbelievable, especially when oftentimes employees in HR is seen as a cost center, right? So the ability to turn around and say, no, they're generating 2.3 times is tremendous. Um, the amount of revenue increases. And then they also look at innovation. Here they say they rate themselves as 170% better, but they've all, research has also shown that diverse groups perform and are in fact more innovative because they're listening to one another's perspective, right? From a CEO perspective, when we're starting to look at leaders, the topic of diversity and inclusion, which was nice yeah. to have back in the day, 
as you can see here, more and more organizations and CEOs are committed to it. I know at SAP, Bill McDermott, our CEO, he's, he's highly committed to diversity and inclusion now as part of our strategy moving forward. Um, and he's not alone. You see here, 85% of the CEOs say that if they had a DNI strategy, that they're sure it would enhance their performance. Uh, but it also helps you generate money into the economy, right? So extending beyond the business. There's a research that McKinsey put out, and they said basically, if as a global economy we're able to achieve gender equality, it's going to add $12 trillion to the global domestic product, right? That's just gender parity, which is crazy because it's something that we oftentimes talk about the numbers, but we can't put that financial piece around it. Um, at SAP, for example, one of the things that we did because we were struggling to build a business case for diversity, we did some research and said, okay, well, diversity and inclusion is closely tied to employee engagement. Yeah. And we worked with PwC and, and built out how we would measure employee engagement, and a lot of it had to do with inclusion. But what was the financial return for SAP if we focused on employee engagement as a measurement? And so at the end of the study, what we found was that for every one percentage point that we were able to increase employee engagement, we added 35 to 45 million euros directly to the bottom line. So it's just for every percentage point. So two years ago, we increased 2%. This past year, we increased 3%. So when you think about that, 5 percentage increase over two years, that's a tremendous amount of money that just went right to the bottom line with really minimal, I'll say, financial investment, right? When you look at Canada specifically, so I know we have a lot of people in Canada, um, it makes really good sense to start to focus on this because there's a, the, the workforce in general is getting a lot older, right? I think in 2001, um, when the first batch of baby boomers turned 55, only one in, in 10 Canadian workers was at least that age. But as they're looking forward, it's going to be one in one in four, right? And so in Canada specifically, they're, they're aging workforce, but they're also not going to have as many people entering the job market from research that's been out there. Some of the other things, that was the financial business case, right? Which I think is so strong. Um, but there's also other things that you can't always measure directly. So employee engagement for us, we spent time really trying to quantify employee engagement. But the reality is when you look at employee engage engagement and you're able to create sort of these bias-free workplaces, you're gonna be able to better not only attract talent, but you're gonna be able to better retain the employees that you have, so that reduces turnover costs, and you're gonna be able to also motivate them better, so productivity per employee will also go up, right? From an innovative standpoint, DNI impacts it because you're pulling together all of these elements of experience experiences and just ways from a culture perspective, from a gender perspective, um, all of these different experiences that people have. And when you are able to listen and place value on that, you're far more innovative, right? Um, so I've heard a, a ton of stories and I'll tell you a few stories and a little bit about innovation, but um, for sure, this has been a big thing that companies use to tap in to new markets um, or even from a technology perspective create technology that people will need before they even know that they need it, right? Which leads us to the last one around customers. Um, we talked about the world becoming more diverse in general. Well, that also translates to customers are becoming more diverse. So to be able to leverage your own employees that may mirror the customers, um, you're gonna be able to create products, you're gonna know what they need, how to interact with them, um, and it just increases your customer satisfaction as well. Okay. We'll move forward because I think it does seem a little simple sometimes to say this, but when you reflect back on some of the numbers when it comes to diversity, we really haven't been able to move the needle, right? Um, and it's incredibly complex. There's no silver bullet for a solution. Um, and it's complex because of something we'll talk about in a little bit, which is bias. 
but all of these different elements that you see on, on the screen right now um, are areas of the business where bias starts to intersect maybe our judgment. So as a result, it really, we're reliant on individuals and the way that they think to create even how an organization is structured, right? Um, it's very human in terms of how we shift, shift through rather um, who applies, whether we wanna call those applicants back or whether we don't call those applicants back. Um, I saw a study um, at the beginning of the year uh, on just applicants in general, right? And they were studying applicants who had black sounding names versus, Afri or versus applicants that had white sounding names. And what they found was that those with black sounding names, the chances of them getting a callback from submitting a resume was extremely low. And then the study changed the um, resume so that it replicated, it was exactly the same, but it increased in the areas of experience and education, still exactly the same. And they found that for the white sounding names that submitted the resume, the chances of getting a callback went up 30%. For the black sounding names, it only went up 10%, right? And so I think that speaks to, well, why? It's the exact same information. These people on paper had the exact same qualifications. Was it our bias coming into play? And that follows throughout the life cycle, right? We see it, we hear it in the news, um, especially in the Silicon Valley right now, where people are more vocal about why they didn't get a promotion or there's more focus being put on how are you moving employees through the life cycle? Who, who are you hiring? How many applicants? What does that look like, right? So companies are really struggling right now to figure out how do I get more diverse candidates to even apply to my job? And then when they apply, how can I really go forward and select the best person for our organization and, and manage the bias or push the bias out as best possible, right? Which takes us to our next poll. I mentioned the word bias. You see it up here, unconscious bias. Um, but have you ever heard of unconscious bias before? Let's take a quick poll here and we'll see what people say. All right. There we go. Okay, good. So most of you know what it is, and some of you are do, but you're not quite sure what it means. So great. So if you can close out the poll, I'll move forward and I'll do a quick explanation. Um, so unconscious bias is really something that's just embedded in who we are. It doesn't make us bad people. Um, there, Harvard had an, an implicit bias quiz you could take to find out uh, what your specific bias are. Um, but it's really inherent. So if you look at this graph, at the center of it is, is you, but all the rings on the outside formulate the perspectives that you bring to the table. So you have things that are much more um, sometimes obvious in nature for the most part, uh, things like your age and race, things that you don't have uh, control over, shall we say. And then as we move out, there's other influences that come into play, right? Are you from a um, divorced home, home? Are you from a single parent home? Um, were you educated? Do you have college, doctorate, right? So all of these things start to come into play and formulate your views on the world and how you approach life in general. And then the last ring that you see on the outside is more work-related. So as you people go into the workforce, they do start to, are they more technical? Are they a full-time employee, part-time employee? All of these experiences as well add up to what you bring to the table uh, in terms of your perspective at a business level. And I think it's really important because I can tell you personally, I worked was working with an executive. I brought him out to see a client one day in an old role that I had. And then we just started talking and he was very curious. He kept asking me questions like, what was your background? Where did you come from? And I mentioned to him that I used to be a district sales manager at Frito-Lay, completely unrelated to my current role. But he just stopped dead in his tracks and said, I wish I knew that yesterday because we were just down at Frito-Lay trying to um, sell them business, right? And so it speaks to the fact that if there was a way where we could start to tap into all of our employees' experiences, it would go a long distance in terms of revenue and the way that we do business. This is one of my favorite stories, speaking of Frito-Lay. Um, back in the day when I was there, the 
coolest team was the new product development team because they got to decide what kind of chips would come on the market and what kind of snack foods. And, and they were just, you know, we would sit and wait for it in the field to see what was coming next. And it was always announced at the Super Bowl. But that was the coolest team that everyone sort of aspired to work on. But what happened is Frito-Lay recognized that they needed to shift. They wanted to shift into the Latino market. Um, it was a growing population. They recognized this. At the same time, they had their Latino employee network raising their hand and saying, you know what, we're tired of just putting on network events. We want to get more involved with the business. So the Latino employee network went to the new product development team and said, we have ideas for chips. And they listened. And so together they put out the guacamole Dorito chip, which went on to be extremely successful in new launches in the Dorito product line recognizing then that this worked really well when they just tapped in their employees, they said, well, what could happen if we started to tap in to our customer base? So Frito-Lay then launched the Do Us a Flavor contest. And the contest winner, you know, obviously their chip got made, um, but they also got some sort of financial rewards. So this was the 2014 Do Us a Flavor contest winner. Um, I did just see on the news the other day that they launched it again. Um, so be anxious to see what the new chip is as we go into 2018 for sure. It also, so this example opens our eyes right to the fact that perspectives are everywhere. So they're in our employee base, but they're also walking around with the people that touch and use our products every day and some that just don't, but they have the expertise. So you're seeing this very interesting thing take place. You have these crowdsourcing sites that are popping up and that companies are using to really start to drive innovation, right? We have 99designs, that's more of a marketing crowdsourcing well, site. We also have Quora, so if any of you are familiar with Quora, that's where you can post a question and then you get points for answering it. And then you have things like My Starbucks Idea, where they're asking for um, ideas from not only employees, but also customers. I believe that's how the little red stick got, <laughs> came to fruition at Starbucks. So you see companies tapping into these, these crowdsourcing platforms, as well as individuals themselves, some do it just to answer homework questions. Um, likewise, we're also seeing diversity and inclusion start to be a focus in terms of culture, right? And, and making or breaking companies. So companies like Uber, they've been in the news um, a lot lately. <laughs> Theranos is in the news, Upload, which is a virtual reality organization, were in the news. And I highlight this because even if a company is small, I always encourage them to focus on what is their strategy? What is their culture going to look like? Are they going to be diverse? Are they going to be inclusive? And start to build that in at that level. Because once you grow to thousands and thousands of people, it becomes much more difficult to change. If you understand it at the beginning and, uh, and are aware of it and are very um, you know, specific about the actions that your organization needs to create the culture, it's a lot easier to change. And also you'll reap the rewards a lot faster from an innovation perspective and financial perspective. Right. What does bias look like in reality? Um, so this is Susan Boyle. I don't know how many of you know her, but Susan Boyle was on America's Got Talent. And, and there's embedded links, so this will be in the presentation when it's sent around. But um, if you recall the audition, and if you haven't, you should definitely go out and YouTube it. But her initial audition for America's Got Talent, she went on stage, and people literally laughed, laughed at her. So, I mean, people rolled their eyes. They laughed at her. How she doesn't fit the image of what... Um, a rock star or somebody who has amazing talent should look like. So it was purely our bias from an image perspective. Long story short, I think we know what happened. She began to sing and she had one of the most amazing voices that they've ever heard. And Simon Cowell even said, okay, I'm sorry. I was completely wrong. I'm totally sorry. And so he acknowledged his, his bias at that moment. The other person I'll call out is Magic Johnson. So Magic Johnson is best known for his basketball career. What a lot of people are, aren't aware of when it comes to Magic Johnson is that he's gone on to become an extremely successful businessman. And he's 
become a successful businessman simply by tapping into a perspective that has been ignored by specific businesses, right? And so his first business venture, he thought, it was in 2008, the economy was going downhill, and he approached Sony and said, I want to open up movie theaters in urban America. And they laughed at him. They said, well, no one's going to the movies anymore. He said, no, in urban America, they will. It's a community event. It'll bring the community together. He went on to build a couple of different movie theaters in urban America, and they, went, they were extremely successful from a financial perspective, right? Think at the end, he had several, several, several movie theaters in urban America. He then learned from that and looked at businesses and approached Starbucks. So he flew out to Starbucks, met with the owner, and said, you know, I want to open Starbucks. And the owner said, well, you know, we don't yeah. do franchising yeah. at Starbucks. He said, I understand that. I want you to be my partner, and we're going to go into urban America. Well, at first, Starbucks was very hesitant about it. So he brought them to his movie theater. He said, we're, we go to the movies completely different in urban America than others do. And he had the owner of Starbucks sit through the experience. And when they walked out, he said, my idea is to bring Starbucks to urban America, um, but change it. So we're not going to eat scones. We're going to eat sweet potato pie. We're not going to play Coldplay. We're going to you know, listen to Lionel Richie. So he tweaked the business model slightly for the customer experience. And what happened was amazing. He ended up having the top grossing Starbucks in North America. And I think at the end, he ended up opening up 100 plus Starbucks and all of them were top performers. So he did it simply by taking something that was successful that an organization wasn't considering in terms of market expansion. And he expanded the market and made it even more successful than it was. So it's a lot here that I threw at you with, with a little bit of introduction to unconscious bias. Um, but a lot of times what I'll get then is, well, how can I get started, right? SAP is a massive company. You must have a lot of resources, which we didn't at the time. Um, but how can you get started? So these are some of the lessons that I've learned, I call them lessons from the trenches, um, because I think they're so key to how we approach diversity and inclusion in a very simple and achievable way. Uh, the first thing I always tell companies is to understand your as is, right? Don't implement things based on external research. Uh, when I first joined as the head of gender equality, um, McKinsey at the same time had put out there why women thrive in the workplace. And a big piece of that was that companies need to have sponsorship programs for women because, you know, that's the key to getting more women at the top. Uh, well, I woke up the next morning and I think 10 executives had sent the research to me all saying this needs to be a priority. We need to have a sponsorship program. Uh, and so I had to push back a little bit and say, well, guess well, sponsorship is not going to address our issues. And so just understand the as is for you, understand where your challenges are, and understand how they're all interrelated. Also, the third bullet you see here is understand how you're going to measure goals. Uh, when I first joined as well, there was a tremendous amount of activities. I think I had 10 different flavors of a, a female mentoring program, um, and no one was really clear in terms of how we were going to measure success. I talked about our employee engagement score. Ultimately, that's now how we measure success. But back then, there was no clear measurement for our goals. And when you have a goal that you're trying to move towards that you can measure, you'll be amazed how quickly you can filter through a lot of the activities and filter out a lot of the work that people are doing. And then the last thing is don't fix something that can't be confirmed as a problem. Um, so many people would say, oh, you know, recruiting the issue, like we have a recruiting issue. But no one had done any of the work to really find out, well, is it an issue in recruiting or is that a symptom of something greater, right? So I always tell people, make sure that you validate what people are telling you or what you're seeing as an issue. Data is a great way to do it. At least let you know where to start looking. But don't fix something that in the end is a symptom and not truly a problem. Uh, and the end of the day, this isn't like sales. I know a sales mantra is if you increase the number of activities, eventually you're going to have impact. 
Um, diversity and inclusion is not like that. But if you do more activities, it does not always equal impact. It could have actually the reverse effect. Um, so going back to all of the points that I mentioned above, really get focused on which activities are going to help you fix the root and establish a really strong foundation so that ultimately can drive impact. And then lastly, a couple of simple ways to get started. Um, assess where your organization is at. Ask simple questions, right? Look at the dimensions of diversity that you can measure. Generational, for example. Gender is one of them. Um, if you have employee networks, see if you can tap into them to get a better understanding of, you know, maybe it's race or ethnicity. Uh, but really assess where your organization is at in those dimensions across life cycle. So how many, you know, how many women um, have you married or have you, sorry, hired? How many, how many people are married? How many people are not married? So those things that you have access to are great in terms of understanding what your organization looks like. The second point is definitely executive sponsorship. This is a huge piece in driving any diversity and inclusion strategy. If your executives are struggling to understand DNI, build that business case, take the time to get them on board. It will make your life a lot easier in executing um, and constantly communicate, build into their communications even, even if it's one sentence about diversity or generations or women and leadership, whatever it might be, your strategy. If they can talk about it, it just reinforces it over time. And they are selling, the more they say it, the more people understand it and get behind it. The third is, is leveraging your employees. I talked about the Frito-Lay Latino Employee Network at SAP. We have a really strong employee network. Um, and we are always encouraging those networks to expand, um, even to collaborate with one another and to get more involved in the business. Networks can be a great way to drive employee engagement and have employees really feel like they're part of the organization um, and influencing the organization and feel valued. And the fourth one is the like me hire. <laughs> Oftentimes people will say, well, I, I had get diverse candidates into the door, but then when they go to meet the manager or the hiring manager, the hiring manager doesn't want to hire them. And a lot of times they can't explain why for the most part. Um, so simple things that I like to use are if you're talking with a hiring manager and you're recruiting, focus on the job criteria. I always tell people, start out with the job criteria, right? Before we get started talking about the candidates, let's go over what's needed for the job and then go into the candidates. Because when you just dive into the candidates, what you'll find is that managers can't always explain bias if it is present. They'll, they'll, expand, they'll change the job criteria to account for the person that they want to hire. Um, so that's what that means is avoiding the like me hires. How many of us have seen teams of people and they all look, they all look the same or have similar backgrounds. Um, and so that's, that's not really helping when you're trying to build a diverse organization. And then the last one is just, you know, get the conversation started. Um, focus on teaching your employees how to be, have, how to have empathetic conversations, how to listen, right? I think a lot of times we like to, to talk and socially we can filter out anything that doesn't agree with us, but how do you get those conversations started in the workplace where it's empath coming from a place of empathy and understanding and people can agree to disagree at times as well, right? And the last one is the education on conscious bias. I know that Facebook actually had made public all of their trainings um, on unconscious bias, they were great conversation starters for people just to understand what it is and also take the the shame and blame out of the, the context of diversity and inclusion, right, and put it more on diversity and inclusion as a benefit to the business and not that somebody um, is doing something wrong if they have bias. I think, as I mentioned before, we, we all have them. It's just part of who we are. Um, but the most important thing is that people are aware of them when it's having a negative impact on the business. So I'll stop there. I don't know if we want to open it up um, to any questions. I'm happy to answer any that people might have. Uh, and if there's points that you want me to touch further on as well. Thanks, Nicole. That was really um, informative. We do have a couple of questions. Um, the first question is, how do I talk to one of my managers who refuses to hire people based on age? 
even if they have a good background, what do I say? Um, who refuses on age? Well, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, well, I would dig deeper and find out why, right? Um, what, what is the age thing? I've heard people say to me, to you, I won't, hire, I won't work for anyone that's, that's younger than me. And I think it's silly. I think the context needs to be put on the business and not the manager, right? So having it more from a business perspective and removing, I think sometimes the emotional, they're not arguing over, they might have the issue with the age, but the reality is that the company is focused on the outcome. And if this is the best person for the outcome, you know, that's the conversation I would be having. Um, if it's a manager that I would say continues to refuse to hire on age, there's things like coaching that I know we've used here at SAP too, coaching with that particular manager, um, or then it becomes a performance, sometimes it becomes a performance or a development opportunity for that manager, right? And I think that's where the, the rubber sort of meets the road in terms of what is the organization's commitment to diversity and inclusion? Like, is this behavior always going to be allowed, right? Um, or to what extent do we have to communicate to managers as well what we hold them accountable for and how we expect them to behave and hire? Thank you. Another question, um, and this one came through to me via email um, from one of my clients. When including staff and clients, do you advocate, advocate focus groups, internal surveys? In your experience, what has the fastest and most effective impact to promote inclusion? Oh, it's such a good question because I think oftentimes, I think surveys are a great place to start in terms of getting a pulse on whether your organization is being inclusive. At SAP, we have the employee engagement score. That comes directly out of an annual survey that we run. We have specific questions related to inclusion. Um, but I think that's always a good barometer for where to start uh, when it comes to inclusion. I'll, I also tell people that look at the way that you're, when you talk about diversity and inclusion internally, look at the way that you're talking to the employees, right? Um, oftentimes when we talk about, we'll say, oh, we're very committed to diversity and inclusion. And then organizations will dive into, you know, we need women or we need, you know, African-Americans or Latinos or, you know, more millennials. And when you start to dive into those specific categories, you immediately exclude people, right? People that can't identify with that. And if your messaging continues like that over a long period of time, you actually start to drive that, that feeling of being excluded versus included. Um, so I also say to people, aside from the surveys, figure out how to engage all employees. And one clear way is the messaging and how you talk about DNI. Great, thank you. Another question, are there general targets considered ideal for diversity, uh, diversity levels of gender, um, age, anything like that? Is there any general target? Um, there's, well, I mean, some people will say general targets should be, you know, for women as an example, uh, general targets would be 50-50. Right, 50%, well, 50% of the population works, so therefore, as women, so 50% of your employees should be women. Um, that gets a little bit, it, it gets tricky, right, because not all of them have degrees or skills in, in the areas that, that you're fulfilling in terms of jobs, right? So it gets a little tricky. Um, being in a technology company, for us, it's, it's quite a bit of a struggle. We get that, we had that pushback of 25% uh, when we hit it. Well, why isn't it 50? Well, it's not <laughs> You know, so we had to sort of explain that. It's a real push just to get to 25, and we continue to push forward. Um, so there's no real guidelines, but I would also say look at your, look at, look at your environment, look at your, your hiring um, pool, right? Like, who are you hiring? What are the types of jobs? And then you can drill down from there as well. So if you're, high, if you're a financial company and you're looking to fulfill a, a large number of um, jobs, related to finance, well, you may not have, you may have a totally different talent pool. So they always want to at least mirror, if not, a, you know, pass the um, hiring pool that's available. 
Great. And I think just for the sake of time, one last question. Um, and I know this is a lot of a lot of the um, our clients on the call today are, are running mid-sized businesses. So businesses obviously not as large as SAP, um, and many of them are reliant on an immigrant workforce. So there are a lot of cultural differences within the workforce. So when working mm -hmm. on a diversity strategy, at what point do you look at safety, production? Um, you know, uh, when, there's, when there's certain things like a language barrier or even just integrating a, a very diversified a very diversified culture within the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, I think you I think you build it from the from the ground up. I think it has to be part of it. You have to have people understand it. I mean, SAP is our, our company is based in Germany. Um, but we're all over the world. So we're con we constantly are getting um, those types of challenges that pop up, right? Uh, I had managers reach out to me and say, hey, you know, I have this gentleman, he's from Saudi Arabia, he just joined my team, he won't shake hands with the women, it's creating an issue. <laughs> what can you do to help me, right? Um, and so I gave him some resources that we have. We, we used a company that did quick online training, um, which was also good for sales or anyone traveling abroad. Like if you're going abroad, or if you have someone coming to you um, from a particular country, you could look up the country and really get an understanding of, you know, what are the, what's acceptable etiquette there. Um, I think what I see, what's funny from my standpoint is that now everyone's trying to be so uh, respective of the other culture. Um, so <laughs> as an example, we just had someone from China come um, over and it was a pretty high ranking official. And my manager and I went to the meeting and, and the high ranking official was putting her hand out to shake our hand and we were both bowing to her, right? <laughs> and so it became this funny dynamic where she was trying to be respectful and understand our culture and do business the way that we do it and we were trying to do the same for her. <laughs> so I think the, the effort was there for sure and that's what people would want to see. Okay. Well, thank you. It, it, uh, it really has been um, very informative. And I think the thing I got out of it is that, you know, a lot of companies really don't um, have a strategy in place. Uh, so when you look at the fact that 85%, um, you know, uh, of organizations that have a diversified strategy in place have enhanced performance, I think that speaks for itself, that it is definitely something to keep, you know, top of mind as we go about hiring and really to try and get away from those unconscious biases. So thank you so much. We appreciate it. Um, and we certainly appreciate your time today. Um, just again, um, as we said, guys, um, an email will be sent out, of, out to everyone today with a link to the recording and a copy of the slides. You're also going to see a survey on your screen right now. So we'd appreciate any feedback at all. We want to make sure that if we are doing these, like I said earlier, they are adding value to you and your businesses. Um, and then if you have any additional questions or, they, or uh, any questions on the chat were not answered today, we'll make sure to reach out to you directly. Um, or you could always reach out or contact your local recruiter at the Headhunters or email us at the address on your screen. And thanks again. We do have another upcoming webinar in October. We are still finalizing it. Uh, so we'll let everyone know as soon as we have details on that. But thank you again for your valuable time and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye.